somebody's life with your goodness goodness touch somebody's life with your love touch somebody's life with understanding for that's the only way to show our Father's love. Touch somebody's life as you pass them. You may never get that close again. It's not hard. Reach out in love and help somebody. You'll be surprised how soon that same touch comes back to you. Touch somebody's life with your mercy, mercy. Touch somebody's life with your peace. Touch somebody's life with your example. It is amazing how your own life will increase. Touch somebody's life as you pass them. You may never get that close again. be 
surprised how soon that same touch comes back to you. It would feel to be free. I wish I could break all the chains holding me. I wish I could say all the things that I should say. Say them loud. Say them clear so the whole round world could hear. I wish I could share all the love that's in my. Remove all the bars that keep us apart. I wish I could know what it means to be me. Then you'll see and agree that every should be free. I wish I could give all I'm longing to give. I wish I could live like I'm longing to live. the things that I can do, I'd be starting anew, but it will be overdue. I wish I could be like a bird in the sky, wish I could feel Good evening. I'm Trevor Morrison, and I'm the poor guy who has to follow that. Uh, and I, Janet just told me that, Kim, is it true that your father wrote that song? Wow. Wow. Uh, well, thank you, Rosalind, for that stunning performance of it. And thanks to all of you for being here this evening. Um, I'm the dean of this law school, and never more proud to say that than on the night of the Bell Lecture, this year the 21st Derrick Bell Lecture on Race in American Society. <laughs> the
This is a tremendously important event uh, for our law school community. It's one that we really eagerly await and look forward to uh, each year. Um, I'm really delighted to see so many of Derek's friends and family here in the audience. Um, welcome back to your law school. Uh, I've said before that I did not have the privilege of being a colleague of Derek's. He passed before I joined this faculty. And in fact, I never had the privilege to meet him. Um, but in many ways in my work, and each year at this event in particular, I feel I catch many glimpses of him. Um, and I want to thank all of you for that. I feel that I, among many of us, continue to learn from his example, from his teaching, uh, from his scholarship, from his leadership in so many ways. Uh, I would run out of superlatives before I came close to capturing the enormity of Derek's impact on this law school, on the law and society across this country more broadly. Uh, I'm reminded of something that our, that our friend and graduate, Hakeem Jeffries, said about our graduate uh, and friend and brother, Ken Thompson, who as many of you know, died far too early uh, just last month. Ken was the first African-American district attorney in the history of Brooklyn. And at, uh, at his funeral, Hakeem gave what may well be remembered as one of the greatest speeches in American history, at least as far as I'm concerned. And he talked about how Ken used to have a habit of referring to the people he most admired, the role models he thought of. And he would, he would, you would know that this person had reached that level in Ken's estimation because he would always precede their names with the great, the great Thurgood Marshall, uh, and so on. And uh, Hakeem used this, of course, to elevate Ken himself into that pantheon. And he spoke of, uh, to unbelievably great effect, I thought, the great Ken Thompson. Well, if ever there was anyone who self-evidently deserved that prefix, the great, it was Derek Bell. Um, and we remember him. As a scholar, as a teacher, an activist, he helped foster, I would say he insisted on, a dialogue on the progress and lack of progress of racial reform in the United States. This is a dialogue I don't think any of us needs convincing is in dire need of continuation today, and we do that, helped by Derek's example and leadership. His steadfast sense of integrity permeated every phase of his celebrated career from his early role as the only African American among hundreds of lawyers working in the Civil Rights Division of the US Department of Justice to his role at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund under Thurgood Marshall. Of course, we are grateful that Derek eventually chose NYU Law School as his academic home, where he was admired by his colleagues, uh, by administrators, and by the hundreds and hundreds of students he taught and inspired. Uh, in, in 2012, as one small recognition of that, he posthumously, 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 I can say that, received one of the law school's distinguished teaching awards for his outstanding achievements as a constitutional law teacher and that is just one of the innumerable examples of awards I could cite attempting to capture and to recognize the enormity of his impact. We gather then tonight like we do each year for the Bell Lecture to celebrate his extraordinary legacy. But the Bell Lecture is not just about looking back on Derek with respect and admiration. It is about carrying that legacy forward to continue to enhance and expand the important work that he set forth for racial reform and progress in the United States. The mission of this lecture series is indeed to examine the role of race in American society, and it has, in its 20 previous iterations and will again tonight, served as a very important platform for leading scholars and activists to share their work on racial justice and civil rights. And we are thrilled that this evening, Michelle Alexander is here tonight to share with us her thoughts and to be this year's uh, Bell Lecturer. Uh, she'll be introduced in a moment by our own Tony Thompson, but I want to say personally, Michelle, how grateful we are uh, to have you with us tonight. Thank you for joining us. You'll also hear some from Tony about an exciting development that's happening here at the law school this year, and that's the launch, which will happen formally and publicly in the spring of our new center on race, inequality, and the law. We are tremendously excited 
about the launch of this center. I'm tremendously grateful to Tony uh, for his leadership of this. Uh, many of you might be thinking it's high time that NYU Law School <laughs> launched such a center, and you are right. Um, and we are going to come up to speed very, very quickly in this space, and with your help, I think it can achieve a great deal. Um, but it is my formal duty now to introduce someone who truly needs no introduction, uh, Dr. Dr. Janet Bell. In a community full of special people here at the law school, uh, she stands in a class all by herself, a great friend of this school and really visionary. As you know, the Bell Lecture Series was her idea. Uh, she conceived of this as a gift uh, for Derek's 65th birthday. And that's not at all surprising that uh, she is the uh, inspiration behind this. Uh, she is such a compelling leader herself with a deep personal commitment to education and to public outreach. Uh, Janet's own career is an inspiration. We're so grateful to have her as a leader of this community. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Janet Bell. Thank you. Oops. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Dean Morrison, for your institutional support as the dean of this great law school, but also for your graciousness and personal support. I love this dean, don't you? Yeah. Derek lived to teach, and teaching kept him alive. For him, it was always students first. It was a mantra in our household. In that universal encyclopedia, his portrait is the definition of mentor. For him, there was no higher calling than teacher. It is gratifying and humbling that students and deans who had never met him in person are very much his students and disciples continuing to carry on his work with integrity and dedication. I'd like to acknowledge the three Bell sons, Derek Bell III, Douglas Du Bois Bell, and Carter Robeson Bell. Yes, you got the names. <laughs> Our family wit is Carter Bell. He notes, that, he notes that he has three last names, Carter, being in honor of Derek's mentors, Robert L. Carter and his wife, Gloria. The late Judge Carter argued the first Brown v. Board of Education case before the Supreme Court and taught at this school. By the way, Derek's other mentor was the great, the great <laughs> judge and civil rights attorney, Constance Baker Motley. I'd like to especially acknowledge Derek's baby sister, Janet A. Bell, who traveled again from Pittsburgh to be with us today. Thanks for helping to get this lecture and to maintain Derek's legacy must go to our adopted daughter, Lisa Marie Boykin, NYU 95. <laughs> A first among equals who is a faithful and incomparable standard bearer of all things Derek Bell. I want to lift up the memory of Derek's first wife, a phenomenal woman, Jewel Hairston Bell, who died before Derek and I met. As partners, they created the life that we know as the life of Derek Bell. They blazed trails together. They were both pioneers. 20 years ago, 21 years ago, the Bell Lecture co-founders shared a dream with me. Judge Robert L. Carter, Paulette Jones Robinson, and Valerie Kavanaugh and William Kerstetter. Valerie and Bill represent an illustrious and fierce group of social justice and legal advocates. They come every year from California and they're sitting right there. Come on, people. You know, this, we don't see you.
Joining our village is the international lawyer, Alice Young, one of Derek's first students at Harvard. First row, she along <laughs> with Harvard professor Charles Ogletree helped endow this series. We've had recent assists from Dr. Kitty Muldoon Steele and Louis Steele, who are here as well this evening. <laughs> Bell lectures have been consistently terrific, stellar academics, and who have just forged new ground in the legal academy. The tradition continues tonight, of course, with Michelle Alexander. Thank you, Michelle. Also with us tonight are former Bell lecturers, William Chip Carter, who is a professor and dean at Derrick's alma mater, the University of Pittsburgh, and Sherilyn Eiffel, who is last year's Bell lecturer, who is the president of the Legal Defense Fund and a professor herself. Thanks go to others who really had a part in this lecture series. And that was former Dean and University President John Sexton, who was a student of Derrick's at Harvard, who championed this series from the very beginning. His successor, Dean Ricky Revez, and enduring thanks to what used to be called BLAPA, which is now called LACA, the Law Alumni of Color Association, and its president, Rafiq Kalamadine, who's sitting there. Thank you, Rafiq. <laughs> Special thanks must go to the Office of Development and Alumni Relations for their care and attention to this series year after year. And she always disappears because she's always working so hard, acknowledging Kelly Spencer. Yeah. If you see her, just give her a high five. She always, always takes great care for this series. Now, on behalf of the Bell extended family, I again pledge our continued commitment to this wonderful law school, represented in part by the lecture series and the courtyard bench with a plaque in Derek's honor. I urge you to go to the bench, sit there, reflect, and renew your commitment to the law and social justice. And I have to say something about Vice Dean Randy Hertz. I like to embarrass him because he's so humble. He's been the faculty liaison for the Bell Lecture since Derek's passing, and he's held my hand these last five years. Thank you, Randy. To introduce Anthony Tony Thompson is really pretty easy because the students here know him. He's a professor of clinical law and he's very actively involved in making sure that students are first, which is part of the Bell Mantra. And he has, he designed and developed the first course in this country focusing on offender reentry, formerly known as the offender reentry clinic. Thank you. He's done a lot of things, but one thing I'm going to do tonight is pass the torch to him in terms of the lecture series because the lecture series, which I will still be involved in as I have been, will be part of this new Center on Race, Inequality, and the Law. Tony, would you please come up? Now, this gavel was given to Derek by Blapa, now Laka, and I think it's okay, Rafiq, if I pass it on. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you. Now, I, there's one other thing we have to do. Now, I don't know if Tony can sing or not, but um, <laughs> I was so excited about passing on the gavel, I forgot to say that Derek loved music, and every program, as you know, usually starts with music. And so I'm going to ask my friend Rosalind Burrow to come up here. And we have to do one thing that we do every year. Because you know it's a lecture series, but it's also a celebration of Derek's birthday. That's why it's in November. So every year, some of you do not get the memo, and I know who you are, that we're doing the Stevie Wonder version of Happy Birthday. So. Tony, you don't have to sing unless you... I got you... the right person to the mic. 
So with that, this is a celebration of Derek's exemplary life of meaning and worth. I would like to say that Rosalind Burrow, 17, 17 Broadway shows, <laughs> Linda Twine, one of the first African-American musical directors on Broadway. Thank you, Linda. Let's hit it. So now I have film evidence of singing for my wife and for Cheryl and I who laughed through that whole performance. So I just want you to remember that. Um, I, I want to say a couple of things. One, that I recognize the late hour, so I'm going to keep my comments brief. I want to say that how proud I am of this institution. Um, I too, ironically, have been here for 21 years now uh, this year. And those of us in this room recognize and appreciate that we cannot fully understand the American legal landscape unless we understand the implications of race and inequality in America. And our new center will focus on those. The center will provide opportunities for students and scholars, community members and advocates to talk and think about issues of race and equality. And make no mistake, our agenda is bold, it is ambitious, and it is forward-looking. But for me, the most important thing about this interdisciplinary center, both personally and professionally, is that it will house this lecture series. A lecture series named for my mentor, for my friend and my colleague, Derek Bell. So tonight, I am honored to introduce our speaker, professor, author, and activist, somebody who I have known, I hate to say how long. <laughs> um, but in her usual revolutionary and creative way, she wants to shake up our normal procedure. So rather than a lecture, she wants to engage in a dialogue that will talk about the influence of Derek, Be Derek Bell's work and life on her own and on our future. Before I invite her up, let me say a little bit about Michelle. She was a graduate of Vanderbilt University. She received her law degree from Stanford Law School. She clerked on the US Supreme Court for Justice Harry Blackman and the District Court of Appeals for Abner Mikva. She was the director of the Racial Justice Project in my home in Northern California, and she directed the Civil Rights Clinic at Stanford Law School. She was at a law firm, and she was at Ohio University as a law professor, and now she is a visiting professor at Union College. But what got everybody's attention was that she published The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. It is one of the most profound contributions to our conversation on race in a generation. Please join me in welcoming my good friend, Michelle Alexander. We're glad to have you here, Michelle. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. When you accepted our invitation, you said you had been longing to give a tribute to Derek and his work and look at its influence on your life and your path. I mean, that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, but for some, there might be one or two people in the audience who haven't read your book. <laughs> and, 
could you talk a little bit about your thesis and what you argued and the success of the book? Were you surprised that it was a bestseller? <laughs> well, first, I just want to say thank you um, to all those who were involved in bringing me here tonight. Um, I was just so deeply honored when Janet reached out to me and invited me to participate in this lecture series. Um, I have been hoping for an opportunity to express how grateful I am um, for Derek Bell's life and his legacy and what an extraordinary impact he had on me as a law student and as a young lawyer, even though I think I only met him briefly a couple of times. Um, but his work, his writing, and his life example um, had such a profound impact on me. And so it's just with such enormous gratitude that um, you know, I'm, I'm here tonight. Um, as far as the success of the book, it absolutely was a surprise to me and I think everyone around me. <laughs> Um, you know, when I first decided that I was going to write the book, um, I was teaching at Stanford Law School as a clinical professor. I was directing the civil rights clinics there, and I was fresh out of my work directing the racial justice project at the ACLU and having represented victims of profiling and police brutality and really having been shaken into my own awakening that our criminal justice system wasn't just another system infected with racial bias in our society, but was in fact truly operating as a thinly disguised form of racial and social control, eerily reminiscent of eras we not so long ago <laughs> left behind. And while I was at Stanford, when I announced to some of my former mentors, since I had gone to law school at Stanford before I taught there, um, that I was planning to write a book arguing that our criminal justice system functioned much more like a racial caste system than a system of crime prevention and control, I was immediately told, are you crazy? <laughs> you can't write that, you know? Um, we're hoping that you decide to switch on over to the tenure track and write some real law review articles. Can't you, you know, write a case study about one of the cases you were working on at the ACLU? Um, can't you be reasonable just for a few years until you get tenure and then you can say any kind of crazy thing you want? Um, and I have to say that, you know, there was a part of me um, that really deeply wanted um, to succeed in that kind of traditional path. Stanford had never tenured a black woman as uh, another law faculty. And, um, you know, in many ways, um, you know, I felt that having people on the law faculty who were committed to racial and social justice and were going to kind of carry on the traditions that you know, Derek Bell and Kim Taylor Thompson, who was there as my professor, my wonderful professor when I was in law school, um, Chuck Lawrence, who was at Stanford Law School when I was a student, and Mari Matsuda, who had been there. I had been taught by some of the most extraordinary people, and I wanted to be able to provide the similar kind of inspiration to students that they had. And so I was really torn. Um, but I have to say that I think in part because of Derek Bell's courageous example, um, walking away from Harvard Law School um, in protest of their refusal to um, hire an African American woman, um, that I had to stop myself and say, what's really more important? Um, you know, making it <laughs> myself, or do I really feel called to speak a truth that needs to be spoken? And if I can't speak it here with the support of my colleagues, then maybe it's time to go. 
Um, and nearly everyone I spoke to said that this was a terrible idea, was a disaster, that I would be ruining my career. Um, you know, and when I decided to go to Ohio State, people said, well, you're going to a lesser school. Um, you know, where is it on the rankings compared to Stanford Law School? Um, but I am so grateful to have had kind of the example that Derek Bell offered um, of walking away from privilege, walking away from elite institutions in order to do the kind of work that you truly believe is necessary or to stand for your principles. And I know Derek Bell was criticized by many for his decision to you know, resign from Harvard and some said that it smacked more of chauvinism than chivalry. And I understood um, why they offered that criticism. But for me, when I was a law student, what stood out um, for me was that he was willing to sacrifice privilege um, in order to stand for justice. And even though he might be wrong or make mistakes in that process, that he was going to have the courage to stand for his convictions. Um, and so, you know, I left Stanford Law School in order to write the book, and um, I, like many people, didn't necessarily expect it to be successful. <laughs> um, in fact, in many ways, it was published at the worst possible moment because Barack Obama had just been elected our nation's first black president, and our nation was awash in post-racialism. Um, and so people were looking at me saying, how can you say our nation has something like a caste system? We just elected Barack Obama. Um, and so I spent really the first two years after the book was published um, speaking to half-empty church basements, speaking to anyone who would listen. Um, and it really took two years um, of kind of screaming in the dark um, before the message began to resonate. Um, and so I can say, yes, I'm surprised, but it's also what I hoped. Um, I really hoped and prayed that if people had access to the information and the stories and the history and the data um, that I finally came to have access to, that they might too have their own awakening and that this book might help plant seeds right along all of the other seeds that have been planted by so many other civil rights lawyers, activists, um, academics, um, and that it might help uh, inspire an awakening regarding you know, the magnitude of the harm suffered to communities um, by mass incarceration and the links to our racial history and so, our racial presence. So you had this kind of half-baked academic book you were trying to write. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and the, the book was, what, 150 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> what do you think accounts for the success? Well, you know, I have to say, I think that what accounts for the success really is a vindication of Derrick Bell's interest convergence theory. You know, Derek Bell, um, you know, wrote in, you know, one of the most influential law review articles for me personally, um, that, you know, progress for African Americans cannot be well explained by white morality, um, by appeals to um, justice, um, or really by any other factor more than just white self-interest, particularly economic interest. And that if you look throughout our history, you can see that many of the greatest moments of breakthroughs, um, racial gains have been made for reasons that are best explained by whites' perceived interests um, as opposed to any other stated or imagined reason. And, you know, although it seemed when my book was first published that it was coming out at the worst possible moment, um, in many respects, it came out in the best possible moment. <laughs> because um, our nation was 
dealing with the fallout of uh, the housing market collapse, um, you know, state budgets across America um, were shrinking rapidly. States like California and Ohio were, you know, threatened with bankruptcy. Um, and sudden, suddenly, across the nation, you had these former get tough true believers, you know, like Newt Gingrich, among others, who were suddenly saying, oh, we can't possibly maintain this vast prison state we've created without raising taxes on the predominantly white middle class. Maybe it's time for us to reevaluate the system of mass incarceration we've constructed. Maybe it's time for a little bit of downsizing. Um, maybe it's time for us to shift course um, because we cannot afford to maintain this massive prison system. Um, and it's also been the case that in recent years we've seen an explosion of white drug addiction. Um, you see the meth epidemic and heroin epidemic, you know, impacting white communities, um, you know, in ways very similar to the crack epidemic as it, you know, washed through black communities. And now that white folks are, you know, facing drug addiction and drug abuse and dealing with the prospect of their loved ones, um, you know, facing harsh mandatory minimum sentences and not getting the treatment and help they deserve. Suddenly now we hear politicians saying, oh, well now it's time for us to show greater care, compassion, and concern for those who are suffering from drug addiction. And it doesn't help simply to lock people up and throw away the key. And so in so many respects, I think we see that, you know, the moment that this book <laughs> came out was at a moment when um, people across the political spectrum um, were for reasons not related to a sudden awakening to um, the humanity of black people. Um, you know, this, this turn in the kind of national consciousness I don't think can be explained um, simply by, you know, a, a growing concern of, you know, the black lives that have been shattered. Um, by mass incarceration, but instead I think are best explained this sudden interest in criminal justice reform and um, the openness um, even among cons many conservatives to the message of my book um, has much more to do, was better explained by Derek Bell's interest convergence theory than just about anything else. Well, when you talk about interest convergence theory, you talk about the explanatory power of it. Um, I've known you a long time, and I've heard you in speeches talk about change as tinkering around the edges of the machinery. Mm -hmm. um, you seem to be arguing in the book, and I've heard you say publicly, that you think that there's um, an inability to imagine racial justice through piecemeal or partial policy reform. How do you think we get there? Well, you know, it's interesting. When I was, when I graduated from law school and I kind of started out as kind of a baby civil rights lawyer, um, you know, I kind of interpreted Derrick Bell's interest convergence theory rather narrowly. I kind of interpreted it as we civil rights lawyers have to take advantage of these political opportunities and moments when they arise and squeeze what good we can out of them <laughs> um, and just keep doing that over and over um, because as Derek Bell argued, you know, actually achieving um, major transformational change is unlikely, uh, you know, in our lifetimes. And, you know, I was so idealistic as a law student and a young lawyer that I didn't fully accept Derek Bell's premise that uh, racism is permanent. And I bought into, though, the idea that we should just keep looking for the short term, you know, political opportunities as civil rights lawyers and squeeze what we can out of them. And so when I was at the ACLU, um, I spent much of my time um, trying to squeeze as much as I could out of every political opportunity, lobbying legislators for, 
you know, relatively minor reforms, seeking data collection for law enforcement so that they would track the race and ethnicity of people who were stopped and searched by the police, filing lawsuits, arguing um, simply for data collection so that we could disprove law enforcement claims that, you know, racial profiling was just a figment of black people's collective imagination. And, you know, I spent many, many hours and lots and lots of sleepless nights um, tinkering away um, at the machine, imagining that I was kind of fulfilling the mandate of the interest convergence theory. Now, my views have changed a lot since then. Um, you know, after years of representing victims of racial profiling and police brutality and investigating patterns of drug law enforcement and attempting to assist people who have been released from prison, who just had one closed door after another, unable to find work, barred from public housing, denied access even to food stamps, saddled with hundreds or thousands of dollars of fees, fines, court costs, accumulated back child support. Um, once I came to see that what we were facing wasn't just a criminal justice reform problem, um, but the emergence of a new system of racial and social control, it became painfully obvious that none of this piecemeal reform work held any hope of dismantling the system of mass incarceration as a whole or birthing anything like a just criminal justice system um, that we would spend as civil rights lawyers and advocates the rest of our lives begging and pleading politicians for this little piece of data collection to be passed or signed or won't you please law enforcement institute a slightly better use of force policy than the one you currently have, that we could spend the rest of our lives tinkering and tinkering and generations would continue to be lost to this system. And so now when I think about the interest convergence theory, I think it still has tremendous explanatory power. But I don't think our job as civil rights lawyers is simply to take advantage of political moments, but instead to help build movements that change the calculus regarding what is and is not in the interests of whites. So for example, you know, if you take a look at you know, apartheid and why it finally crumbled, <laughs> It wasn't because white folks one day woke up and say, oh, it's just not really in our interest anymore to maintain this system of segregation and apartheid. No, it was because a movement was built to end apartheid, a divestment movement that changed the calculus of what was actually in the interest um, of whites in that nation. And it was a divestment movement and a movement that shifted global public opinion and turned South Africa into a pariah state that suddenly made it in the interests of whites in South Africa to say we have to end the system of apartheid if we're going to remain economically viable and maintain standing in the global community. Um, and so if I have any critique at all of the interest convergence theory, um, I would say that it, it sometimes does not give, in my opinion, not give as much credit as is due um, to the ability of advocates and activists and ordinary people to create the conditions in which change becomes necessary and unavoidable. And that is what I think we saw in the movement to end apartheid. That's what we saw in the civil rights movement. Um, and I believe we have within our power the capacity to build a truly transformational, even revolutionary movement um, that helps to change um, the culture um, of this country and create, proactively create, 
the kind of crisis that changes the calculus um, for those in power about what truly is within their interest. So I want to talk to you. Before, I want to step back. One of the things that you once said, and it talks about a tension in Derek's writing, is that um, the, the article Serving Two Masters had a profound effect on you, and its intention in many respects was interest convergence theory. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, well, his article, Derek Bell's article, Serving Two Masters, for those who aren't familiar with it, um, you know, is an article that very boldly critiqued um, the civil rights establishment at the time, including the NAACP Legal Defense Funds for its handling of school desegregation cases, arguing that lawyers, civil rights lawyers, um, were often um, so blindly committed to an integrationist agenda that they ignored um, or <laughs> minimized um, the views of black parents who were far more interested in achieving quality education in their own neighborhood schools than having their kids bust across town to schools um, that didn't want them um, and where it wasn't at all clear that they were gonna be receiving uh, superior education, um, though it would be an integrated one. And um, you know the courage that it took for Derek Bell to write that piece at the time that he wrote that piece, I think, you know, has to be noted. Um, he was challenging at the time, you know, his own friends and colleagues um, to think much more carefully about whether or not they were truly serving the interests of the communities they claimed to represent, or whether they were overly um, influenced by a commitment to an ideology um, that was supported and funded um, by white foundations and by people who um, didn't necessarily um, share the interests of you know, poor communities of color who wanted nothing more than for their kids um, to have a good education and for their own communities and neighborhoods to be strong and to thrive. Um, you know, that article for me, I think primed me to be able to see my own complicity um, in the system of mass incarceration as a civil rights lawyer. So when I was working at the ACLU and representing victims of racial profiling, um, it seemed like common sense to represent only the innocent, to identify those individuals who defied kind of the worst racial stereotypes of African Americans, um, and use them as named plaintiffs in the suits we were planning to file as a way of um, communicating to the white public large um, that the police conduct of stopping and frisking and searching um, black folks disproportionately was motivated by race. It had nothing to do with criminality, it was about race. And so, you know, when people would call the hotline we set up, um, you know, to report racial profiling or discrimination by the police, we would send a form to them to fill out, asking them a bunch of questions about their experiences with the police. And one of them was, have you ever been convicted of a felony? We literally asked people to check the box. <laughs> and people would turn these forms, and those who checked the box, we would set aside saying, well, they can't possibly serve as named plaintiffs in any suit we are planning to file against the California Highway Patrol or the Oakland Police Department or the San Jose Police Department or any of the police departments because we knew that if we represented those people, that law enforcement and the media would be all over us saying, well, of course, the police are supposed to keep their eye on them. They're the felons, they're the criminals. This isn't about race, this is about the police going after the bad guys. Um, and so we deliberately um, excluded um, the very people who were 
most impacted by mass incarceration um, from the litigation. We denied them a voice at our press conferences. Instead, when we held a press conference about racial profiling, we would ask the school teacher who was stopped and frisked and made to live spread eagle on the pavement. We asked the military veteran who returned home um, and had his car searched and tore apart while his children were sitting in the back seat of his car um, watching as the drug sniffing dogs circled and barked. Um, we asked the lawyer, a partner at a law firm who was stopped and pulled over, interrogated in his own driveway. Um, we, we held these individuals out, the respectable ones, um, as the ones that America should care about. Um, and we argued in our litigation and publicly that the proof that this system is biased is by the way these good people, these respectable people have been treated. And I have shared a story many times about how I refused to represent a young man who told me he was innocent but had a felony record and I later came to learn um, that he had been telling the truth and that he had drugs planted on him and he had been beat up by the Oakland Police Department and that I hadn't listened to him and I hadn't believed him in part because he had been a felon. And it was when I came to see my own complicity and how as a civil rights lawyer and advocate, I was in fact replicating the very forms of discrimination and marginalization and exclusion that I was supposedly fighting against that I could finally see how the civil rights community has time and time again found itself, um, you know, not for reasons of any malice, um, but for reasons that are complicated and that need to be addressed on the wrong side of some of the most important racial justice issues of our time. And it was that awareness that we, those who think we're on the right side, the civil rights lawyers, the activists who think that we're out there fighting the good fight, that we could well be part of the problem, um, that I decided to write the book. And, you know, um, Derek Bell's example again, of writing scholarship that challenges his friends and his allies, um, saying we may be part of the problem rather than the solution, um, is part of what helped to model for me and make it possible for me a way of writing a book that in the introduction says the civil rights community has been quiet for too long. It has allowed this human rights nightmare to occur on its watch. We have allowed ourselves to silence the very people who have been most harmed um, by a system because we are so committed um, to challenging always this narrative that black people are the criminals and they're, they're the wrong ones. In fact, this is the time when we have to be willing as civil rights advocates and activists to stand um, with the criminals, um, to tell their stories, to be willing to represent them, and to challenge the routine criminalization of African Americans, uh, not just protest um, when one of the respectables um, gets treated the wrong way. You know, I'm, I'm struck, I'm struck. <laughs> Given your vantage point, it is easy to perceive your message as one of cynicism and to perceive your message as um, overly cynical of the system. But I've watched you and I've read your material and I've heard you speak and in fact, you talk about nothing short of a revolutionary movement around racial and social justice. Um, in, in my conversations with Derek over the years and Derek's writing, he talked about the permanence of race and racial injustice as part of the American social fabric and structure. Um, you seem to have a different message. 
how do you, are you in conflict with Eric in that? Well, you know, again, when I um, started out, you know, I just kind of decided to ignore that part of Derek's message. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I appreciated everything else he had to say, but, you know, the permanence of racism part, I kind of pushed to the side. And, you know, there was a part of me who really felt that I didn't know if I could dedicate my life to working for racial justice if I didn't believe we might one day win. Um, and so I, I pushed that aside and thought, okay, well, the road may be long, um, but we'll get there one day, and it's up to me to do my part today. And clearly, <laughs> um, I've seen enough now and learned enough now to understand that the challenges are of a magnitude that I did not appreciate back then. And I think that Derek Bell is absolutely right when he says that racism is just part of the DNA of this country. It was founded with a compromise over slavery embedded into the Constitution. Black people defined as three-fifths of a human being. Um, and we have yet to come to terms um, with that racial history. And it seems unlikely um, that as a nation, we may ever do what is necessary um, to fully come to terms with that and attempt to remedy it um, and uproot um, the racism that is embedded um, in our political and economic systems. But, <laughs> and this is where I may part ways with Derek, and I wish he were alive so I could ask him. <laughs> um, because this is the conversation I would most like to have with Derek today. I believe that revolutionary change is possible because no empire lasts forever. No empire lasts forever. And if we acknowledge that basic fact that America is not going to exist in its current form forever, the, the nation that we know today isn't going to last for all eternity, if, if we can acknowledge that fact, then the question is, well, what is going to replace it? What is going to come into being? And, you know, so I view our task um, as racial justice advocates is not to believe in, the, in America um, that our current political system or our current constitution, certainly not our two-party system financed by corporate America, um, certainly not a constitution that has a 13th Amendment that provides an exception um, for, for criminals. Um, certainly not a constitution that provides basic civil and political rights, but does not provide for basic human rights. Certainly not this constitution, not this political system, but I believe um, that we as a people um, can bring into being a new America, a new nation, a new society, and that what we take for granted, um, that America won't last forever, the question is what are we creating? What are we building? What kind of consciousness shifting must take place? So when that moment comes, when America as we know longer, as we know it no longer exists, that we will be ready, that we will be ready to build something new. And um, you know, I read Ta-Nehisi Coates right alongside Derrick Bell with having a racial realism about the limits of justice in America, given our current political system, our current constitution. And I read with some despair the ending of Between the World and Me, you know, where he says, you know, to his son, um, 
that we must struggle, but don't imagine that the dreamers will ever fully wake up. You know, the planet is heating up, um, and we're all likely to go down together <laughs> in this great big ball of fire. And he may be right. He may be right. But it's not inevitable. It is not inevitable. And I think that those of us um, who have seen <laughs> miracles happen in our own lifetimes, um, people whose lives have turned around in miraculous ways, people who have overcome just extraordinary odds, who have overcome drug addiction, people who have gotten out of prison and dedicated their lives to ensuring that no one would ever have to go through what they've gone through. People who all over this country are standing up, speaking out, declaring that yes, black lives matter and we are still willing to build a revolutionary movement today. I am not willing to concede um, that when this empire ends, and it will, that we are not capable of building something more beautiful, um, a multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy in which every life and every voice truly matters, no matter who you are, where you've come from, or what you may have done. And I don't think this is utopian. Um, I don't imagine that whatever comes after this empire will be a utopia but I think we can create something radically better than what we have, um, something that defies our imagination even today. Um, and it's with that hope um, and that certainty that America as we know it will not last forever um, that I am willing <laughs> and able to continue um, working and organizing and speaking and imagining um, that all of our labors are not in vain. Let me, let me ask you this. The, the first conversation I had with Derek Bell, I was mad at him. I was a second year student at Harvard and he had left. But he impressed upon me and I became his student at that point. Um, many, many years later, I've seen transformative things. I've seen a young lawyer write a profound book um, I've seen in my classes the, the beginnings of an evolution of America in bright young law students and activists. From the vantage point that you're at, what advice would you give the kids and the activists in this room to change the world and create an image and an evolution of a world that you describe and that we all aspire to? Oh, I would say be bold and act with courage. Be bold and act with courage. You know. Um, I think one of the truths about why we've had some difficulty <laughs> in recent years making the kind of progress um, that many of us would like to see is that many of those who are running the show um, in civil rights organizations, um, policy reform, organizations are folks who have gone to good law schools like this one. And you don't get to a good law school like this one um, without being someone who follows the rules. <laughs> um, you know, and I can speak for myself. You know, when I was in law school, I got there not because I'd gotten bad grades or challenged authority, but because I was actually good at doing what was expected of me um, and following the rules and meeting the expectations of people in power. Um, and so if you're at a law school like NYU, you likely are very good at pleasing those in authority. It doesn't count to my students, but. I'm sure not. <laughs> um, but what it takes to be a good law student isn't necessarily what it takes <laughs> to be a good revolutionary. Um, and, and 
so I think that it's important um, to keep that in mind um, when you get out into the world <laughs> and find yourself sometimes at odds with your colleagues, sometimes at odds with the organizations in which you may work. Um, when you find yourself very alone and lonely, speaking a truth that others aren't necessarily ready to hear. Um, being willing to make mistakes and not play it safe all the time. Um, those are the, the traits that I think are required in addition to having a lot more compassion and imagining that perhaps, despite all of the fabulous education and training you've received from wonderful professors like you, that maybe you have a lot to learn from people who haven't had the kinds of opportunities that you've had. Yeah. And for me, <laughs> yeah, one of the greatest educations I received was when I was out of law school working as a civil rights lawyer and I finally figured out that I needed to slow down, stop, and listen to the people who I claim to represent. And it's not enough to listen. We also have to create room, space, for those people to take leadership in this work and in this movement. And, you know, um, I actually would love to introduce um, some folks that I invited here, some amazing folks that I hope you will all have an opportunity to meet individually, um, perhaps after this event is over. Each and every one of them um, has been incarcerated, who knows what this system is from the inside out, <laughs> um, and who have dedicated themselves now um, to ending the system of mass incarceration and bringing their knowledge, their expertise, their perspective, their understandings um, to bear in this time. And uh, they participated, all of them, in a wonderful training program run by Just Leadership USA, founded by Glenn Martin, an organization that's dedicated um, to training um, and developing formerly incarcerated people as the next wave of leaders uh, in the movement to end mass incarceration. And so if you all wouldn't mind just standing for a moment so we can acknowledge the contributions that you've made. teachers um, and recognize that after law school there is still much, much to learn from, from those um, with whom you will be working in common cause. Now I've run over but I've got to ask you one more question. You're a tough act to follow even for yourself. <laughs> for those who kind of care a lot about you and you've affected this conversation nationally in unique ways, what's the next move for you? Well, it's an odd one <laughs> in many respects for me. Um, I've actually now walking, I've decided to walk away from Legal Academy entirely. Um, I recently resigned from OSU's law school and accepted a visiting professor position at Union Theological Seminary. Um, this is an odd move for me because I was not raised in a church. I don't often go to church. <laughs> Um, in fact, if anything, um, you know, I was raised in a household that was deeply skeptical of organized religion. Um, my mother is white, my father was black, and when they got married in Chicago, um, my mother was disowned by her own family, um, but she also was excommunicated from her Lutheran church. Um, an excommunication happened actually before they got married. Um, and they had difficulty finding a pastor that would marry them in the early 60s in Chicago. 
And so I was raised with an understanding that you don't necessarily find God in church. <laughs> and that churches are often on the wrong side of love. They're often on the wrong side of important social justice questions. Um, and so we were raised with a deep sense of um, spirituality, um, but with a real skepticism about churches and organized religion. Um, but I now find myself kind of walking myself over to a seminary <laughs> to study and teach in part because of my deep belief that the kind of truly transformational, revolutionary change that I hope to see and that I do believe is possible um, isn't a matter simply of changing laws or policy. That this kind of transformational, revolutionary change at its core raises profound moral and spiritual questions about who we are individually and collectively, what we owe one another, and what it means to be in right relationship with one another. And I don't think those kinds of deep moral, spiritual, and philosophical questions generally get asked and answered in law schools. <laughs> and so I'm going to a place, Union Theological Seminary, that has a long history and tradition of asking precisely those questions. And um, you know, I am looking forward to you know, embarking on kind of a new journey of learning about what many, many faith traditions and philosophers and cultures um, have to teach us. Um, about the meaning of justice and what kind of post-revolutionary society we ought to be working for. Well, it seems a perfect place to be the home of black liberation theology. Yes. Join me in thanking Michelle Alexander. Thank you.